Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now is a gentleman that I've been on his Twitch stream. I guess I'm on his Twitch stream again right now, which I'm glad I didn't have to set up on my computer because that was a fucking nightmare last time, but worth it because we had a lot of fun. <laughs> He's also a guy that was, in fact, at the L.A. live show. He's a friend. He's a comrade. He's someone that a lot of people have wanted. They like the meeting of the minds that we have. Hassan Piker, welcome. Thanks for being here, man. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. Um, you, are, you are one of my uh, favorite commentators on the left, so it's an honor and a privilege to be here. And uh, probably the best uh, accent uh, maker, impressionist on the left, for sure. Oh, dude, thank you. I'm, I'm honored by that. I, I'm really loving your work, too. And I, when we had that conversation on your channel, which was awesome, because what, I, on this show, I mean, especially because someday when you're in New York, you should come in studio and hang out and do a whole show with us, which would be awesome. But, you know, we do like now we're going to talk for like 20, 25 minutes, which is great. But in your Twitch stream, it's awesome that there's a lot of time and I needed to leave. Like I, I was like running late for something, but I had a lot of fun with you. So I kept, I'd be like, all right, I need to get out of here. And then you'd be like, yeah, but uh, do you want to talk about Dave Rubin? And I was like, fuck, yes. I love that you guys just <laughs> pulled up a, a, a video, I mean, the Twitch stream of, of, <laughs> of me watching you. But um, anyway. We're watching yeah, no, you was, watch. Awesome yeah, time. bro. It's awesome it sucks. It sucks that you're super social and have a social life, unlike me. Uh, so that's why it's, you know, that, that's why I'm able to do these like long uh, videos. <laughs> well, I've, I'm stoked to do more of it. And sometimes, yeah, I mean, social life can mean like having to like go to the fucking bank. Um, but uh, <laughs> let's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> Going to the bank for most Wait, of my life has not been this fun. Is something bro. That my, this is something that my community needs to know as well. I don't know if this is an appropriate question to ask, but this is something that has been making the rounds on the left. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, a ferocious debate. And it is about, I don't know if I should do this, but fuck it, I'm going to do it anyway. Are you, do you, are you familiar with the concept of dry jacking? <laughs> That's a, well, this is a really interesting direction for this show, Hassan. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm, just, I'm guessing you are. Never mind. Let's not do it then. Never mind. It's not. It, it's just something that everyone wants. This is something that I ask people now, but we're not going to get into ask it. Ask me Whatever. on your, you know what, you know what, you know what, Hassan? Ask me when I'm on your show. And I okay, will, we'll do I, that. We'll I, do I will that. get into the details of drugs. <laughs> because you know what the real I'm thing is, sorry. man? is that after you, it's not just that it's my show, which is, of course, a big deal. <laughs> but it's also that, you know, do you know who Milton Alamadi is? I do not. So he's coming on, he's the second guest tonight. And this dude is like, he's one of the best. He's this Ugandan journalist. He's like a mentor of mine. He's a fucking genius. And he, he just like, he just like classes up the whole place. So to me, it's like I already feel bad enough that we're going to make fun of Dave Rubin before he comes on to talk about, like, Thomas Sankara. I can't, I can't be talking about dry jacking 20 minutes or 30 minutes before Milton <laughs> Alamadi's on. I can't do it. It's I'm not so right. sorry. I know. I know. I shouldn't have done that. Um, we'll, you know, we'll you know, what, you know what you will like, though, Hassan? I will, I'll tell you this story. This is, this, is the, this is the Milton Alemani story I'll tell you. Do, do you know the right-wing the right -wing Mandela character? Yeah. So, and, you know, I'm not going to lie. I basically don't care, and I'll do whatever impression, and I don't think about it. But that was the only one that I had, like, a touch of, like, shit, that's a, that's a, that's a, I'm, I'm turning Nelson Mandela into Gavin McGinnis. Like, all right. And so, but, you know, I don't know. Who am I going to ask whether or not that's cool to do? And I, I remember I sent a DM to Milton Alamadi of a Nelson Mandela thing, and he just wrote back, like, LOL, LOL, LOL. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm, I am definitely in the clear. Uh, so do you want to start with Dave Rubin or these guys at the California Democratic Convention? 
Um, I'll do either. It's your show, and I've already <laughs> I've already disrespected the boundaries uh, <laughs> by memeing too close, entirely too close to the sun. So let's uh, let's do whatever you want to do. I'm ready. I'm prepared. Uh, and again, I'm sorry. Oh, it's all good. <laughs> well, I, but, but I will. But I will ask you in private what the answer to that question is, or when you come back on the show, if you ever want to. You have to. <laughs> you literally are going to have to explain what that means to me, though. Like not right now. It, it, but, okay, but I'm, not, I'm not playing dumb with you. I don't know what it means. Um, my guess would be that I'm too busy with my social life to do that. Most likely. Yeah. But um, no, this is something. Yes, this is something that people who have uh, robust social lives uh, don't really um, talk about for sure. <laughs> anyway, let's just let's move on, please. I'm so sorry. It's so cringy. I'm sorry. I think you do. I think you actually want to talk about this a lot. No, this no, is like no, no. I, I promise. I promise. I don't. All right, let's just. I I don't oh believe God. you, Hassan. What's going on? I'm sorry. All right, so Dave Rubin, right? Um, yeah, da- wait, wait. So Hassan, have you ever met Dave Rubin? Do you do you actually know Dave Rubin? Yeah, I, I, I thought I told you this already. We work together. We play basketball every Sunday. Um, and wow. uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with him. So what's, what's, what's uh, yeah. Dave like on the basketball court? What position does he play? Okay, so he's actually not bad, I will have to admit. All right. Um, he's not he's not as bad as you would think he is. Uh, he's pretty good. He plays. I mean, he plays like a shooting guard. Okay. Uh, pretty much. That's usually. I mean, yeah. classic, relatively athletic guy. Bradley Beal. Um, definitely, <laughs> definitely better on the court than he is in the uh, marketplace of ideas for sure. Wow. Have you always thought like I, I'm legitimately because you know that I've asked Anna this, and I'm not trying to be a pain in the ass, and I and you know that I've like. How did you guys work? He's so stupid, Hassan. Like, even if he was right, he's a fucking idiot. Oh, dude. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, Dave Rubin was the first time I I really questioned, uh, like, how much leeway I give to uh, ideological allies, like people who I perceive to be on my side. Because I, I genuinely never realized how dumb he was. You know what I mean? And I don't know if it's because he he is kind of a liberal who's like portraying himself as a conservative, and that's why he comes across maybe more stupid now, uh, or or that he was genuinely this stupid this entire time. Uh, but because he was a liberal, I just simply did not see it. Um, but yeah, I I don't know. I, I just it really it really shocked me to the core seeing how dumb he has become. I don't think he was this dumb. But, uh, but maybe he was just repeating uh, liberal talking points, so I never really uh, questioned it. Uh, I'm going to guess that that was what was going on. Because I, I have actually looked. I didn't really watch him, or I wasn't really aware of him when he was on TYT. And then I kind of got like, okay, this guy's you know setting up this new hustle. Um, and he's going to like, you know, I, like we were pretty early. I was dunking on Dave Rubin, I think, definitely before it was fashionable. And it was like... So, but I did go back to actually see what he was like on TYT, and it it did just seem like somebody else would, you know, articulate a point that they had researched and thought about, and he would just be like, "Yeah, because you know we need the EPA," and uh, here's the Shakira joke, which is my other question, huh. which is, uh, he was hired as he a was comedian. Never funny. He was never funny. What, he was like, never funny. Yeah, I knew, what? I knew that that person was coming. He was never. I never thought he was funny. He was never actually funny. I didn't really understand why he was hired to begin with. Uh, that is a certainty. I can tell you that with a certainty. I just like never questioned whether or not he was intelligent, but I never questioned whether or not he was funny. I knew he was unfunny from the day from the moment I met him. Okay, so that that at least has always been clear. Not funny comedian. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Now this is super ironic because last week while I was in a silent meditation retreat, dry jerking, I admit it. <laughs> I. You know, now you're not going to laugh after you put that whole thing on the table. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> no, I'm laughing. I just, oh, God. Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. Yeah. So. Is that I, <laughs> easy. Go on. Sorry. So I was on a silent meditation retreat, and apparently Dave Rubin, well, I'll put it this way. He finally put something. Now in his iteration as a conservative, he is actually pretty funny. Check this video out. I'm sure you've already seen it, but I, we've got to play some of it. 
Oh, let's Gross. watch. It. So for those of you that aren't uh, playing along on Twitter, God bless you and you're probably living your best life. Um, but basically, uh, Quillette, which is run by Claire Lehman, who's a former guest of mine, who has been very uh, friendly and nice to me uh, on my show and in all of our private exchanges, uh, has done about four hit pieces on me recently um, <laughs> where they're really trying to single me out uh, out of the IDW crew that I'm somehow the worst because I sit down and, and talk to some people that they don't like and I talk to these people on the right and I don't question them exactly as they want and all of these things. Uh, and they keep just writing piece after piece. Now, I got a, a shit ton of haters these days, which really is just a sign that I'm doing something good. Pause I mean, it. Pause it. I love that. Yeah, what do you, do you um, take as a sign? Yeah, to, why do you love that, Hassan? No, it's like, you know, that's what Hitler said, too. He's like, <laughs> you know, haters are my motivators. Like, I guess I must be doing something right if, like, all these people want to, if all these people hate on me. Like, what a, what a ridiculous way. And, and these people aren't even hating on him. They're saying, like, it's fine if you're conservative. They're, it's literally Colette. It's, they're also conservative. Um, right. And they're saying it's okay if you're conservative, just maybe do a better job questioning people like maybe do a better job questioning people like uh stefan molnier uh when he talks about phrenology or or you know low iq people as a dog whistle to like uh ethnic minorities or whatever yep but that's all that that piece was right and he it's literally like, it's pretty fair criticism he is saying right quillette is making like a brand's pivot and part of it is it's not ideological, but they're, it's just a recognition that like if you're going to run around and your whole brand is no holds barred, fearless, we talk about ideas, having some like dimwit stare blankly into space while any crackpot fascist conspiracy theorist whack job sits on his couch and says anything just isn't a good look just on a brand level. And his response is, like, I love, I'm glad you said Hitler, because when I first saw this, I was like, if I had the budget, it would be like the sketch montage video of like Hitler, the, he you know, Al Baghdadi from ISIS, Jared, the subway guy of just a bunch of people say, hey, everybody hates me. Must be doing something right. I've never thought that in my entire life. I wish I, I wish I was like Dave Rubin. I, I mean, I have a lot of haters, but I've never been like, oh, I must be doing something right because these people hate me. But uh, do you it's think... always the opposite. I'm always so deeply insecure about all my haters. I'm like, am I doing everything wrong? Dave Rubin, on the other hand, is sucking down a junior mint uh, a chocolate chip uh, protein shake from the from the same shop that I go to every now and then as well. They have great protein shakes, but that's beside the point. It you know, and, good. and having a, a wonderful day just raging. Well, just this, well, this, well that's seething. but I'm, are you sure about that, Hassan? Well, first of all, because I would say I'm I'm like you. I don't like getting nobody likes getting hated on. Everybody has their insecurities. And I feel like Dave, I don't know, man. This is a twelve this is a a walking periscope rant about how little he like do you really think he doesn't care? Because I'm getting a lot of care feelings out of this. <laughs> yeah, just I'm just you just see that you're just shaking in his little <laughs> booties, uh, freaking out over an article that was like, "Hey, it's fine if you're a conservative, just admit it." And also, when you're you know, stop platforming white supremacists without asking them questions. I mean, imagine being that bad at your job. Imagine being so bad that conservatives, which notoriously have a low barrier of entry, if you want to be a conservative pundit. Uh, are are com are wholeheartedly uh, coming together, banding together to hate on you, including people that are, have been ousted from the community, like Milo Yiannopoulos. Like, how how pathetic do you have to be that conservatives are getting together and being like, dude, we don't want you anymore? Well, I've always said, I think the only thing that ever struck, like, I think, like, whatever, there actually is a purpose in talking and dunking on Dave and Steve Crowder, which we should talk about for a second, too, because I know you just actually did something on Steve. So let's talk about that for a minute. But there, there is a substantive purpose because they they generate so much negativity and they facilitate so much garbage. And again, it's and it and it isn't just because they have different politics. It's absolutely because he's like a blank dimwit 
who has allowed people to spew anything on his show without any critical awareness, while at the same time maintaining the posture that he's, you know, engaging in open ideas and not like essentially, you know, dimwit propaganda. So it, it actually matters to like clarify the record on what somebody's actually doing in their work. But it's all, but the, but on a personality level and as like a comedian, the thing that's always struck me about Dave, that the, like the key to doing like the like, hey, you know, I'm just interested in ideas and I just don't care. I'm just going to live my life is it's very rare to find somebody who is so like he's genuinely a stupid guy he's not smart and he's so fucking cynical <laughs> like that's rare man like when you meet somebody who's like super craven and just like whatever i'm just like i'm gonna do what i do i don't really care they're not they're usually a little bit more clever and people who aren't, you know, and some people who aren't as clever. Yeah, like Ben Shapiro. Yeah, Ben Shapiro is not, like, Ben Shapiro is not as smart as the New York Times says he is, but he's not, like, a stone-cold moron. <laughs> and, like, Dave Rubin yeah. is both, like, super cynical, but also, like, Bolsonaro. Hmm. It's far out. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe... Maybe that's like how you have to be as someone who is from a um, marginalized background, um, historically marginalized background. Like you, that, you have to you have to be really dumb or just super shameless, like Milo. You know what I mean? Like in in terms of like the right wing racket. Yeah, because mm -hmm. like look at Candace Owens. Like I mean, look at every token, uh, the, every single every single race traitor or every single like, uh, I guess, marginalized community trader that goes conservative for the grift uh, comes across really pathetic and stupid, um, possibly because, you know, possibly because they are, they, they can't be too smart or they can't appear to be too smart. Otherwise, they would have to admit that they're being ridiculous. Right? I think you're right. But I think as an example, I'm talking just on a very, like, like, I, like Candace Owens is obviously, in my opinion, like a really, really bad person promoting... Lies and also and, really dumb though, don't you think? Uh, not, like as as not as dumb as Dave no, Rubin. No, not as stupid as Dave. Really? Rubin. No, dude. I don't know of anybody. I, I cannot think of a single person with any kind of media platform that is as dumb as Dave Rubin. I cannot. I can't. Wow. No, I, I would say Candace Owens is like right up there with how stupid no. Dave Rubin is. I mean, no. she said she said Jeff Bezos was a socialist. <laughs> like she unironically was like, "Well, Jeff Bezos yeah, is a socialist. But that's, he, he wants socialism." Yeah, but she just says that because, like, here's what, here's the difference. Candace Owens has a script and she's going to say fucking nonsense. And here's the thing. Here's what I mean about cynical. Candace Owens says that because that's what's to say. And I don't even think she thought about it one way or another. Dave Rubin is the type of guy where Candace Owens says that to him. And he's like, oh, my God, I thought Amazon was great. I wanted them to take over the post office. He's a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> I think no one gave him the talking point because they were like, well, this gay dude was also with the Young Turks. Maybe he's an op. We don't trust him. So the Heritage Foundation uh, actually doesn't <laughs> send him the same talking points that they send to like Steven Crowder and Candace Owens and whatever, which is why he's not in unison with the rest of them. And God knows see, none of these dipshits are actually going to do the reading. Obviously, they're not going to like go and read like, I don't know, Milton Friedman or whatever uh, to, to figure out. Uh, or, or really? to like morally justify their axioms on the conservative end. They're just they're just getting the talking points. That's why they all sound identical. They that's all, right. And and I guess Dave Rubin for some reason didn't get those talking points, and that's why he consistently embarrasses himself in front of actual apes like Joe Rogan. I mean, Joe <laughs> Whoa, Rogan. Oh, shots uh, fired, bro. Admit, <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, Joe Rogan openly. He's the first person to admit that he's not like a very intelligent person, and he. And I think that's part of the reason why he's, he's likable, dude, because he's not a very intelligent person, and he's and because he's not a very intelligent person, he does a pretty decent job of interviewing people right. uh, in a very positive way and getting them to like describe their perspective and all that, and it can be really damaging if it's you know some uh, psychopathic white nationalist. Right. But 
it can be. It, well, it he did. To, like, he did some energy. good reasoning with Dave on the whole. Uh, uh, UPS but yeah, he thing. dunked on Dave. He dunked, and on he him. wasn't even and trying he, I mean, to. That's how stupid Dave Rubin is. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I let we have more. You know what? We'll just do another time when we, because there's other people that you and I got to talk about, like Tim Pool and Crowder and all of this. But I want to play these two clips because I thought this was really encouraging at the California oh, so good. Democratic Convention. So first of all, just let's say right out of the gate, Joe Biden wasn't there. Joe Biden is the main enemy in this primary. But you had a couple of people that were there that make Joe Biden look like Nelson Mandela in terms of charisma and vision. Like, where do you find John Delaney and John Hicken? Like, if you just watch these men talk, you're just like, you know what? We're not going to survive as a species. So let's start with John it's Delaney. So awesome. Oh, my God. John Delaney, who is a former uh, health insurance executive, uh, tell the California Democratic Convention of Grassroots Activists not just say like, hey, here's my pretend fake Medicare for all plan like some of the other candidates did, but just grow up and insult them. But we need, as Democrats, to build an economy that works. But it's got to be with smart policies. Medicare for all may sound good, but it's actually not good policy, nor is it good politics. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Oh, so good. A hundred. <laughs> the, the, the finger. We, we should have universal health care. <laughs> we should have universal health care. <laughs> Look at the Toastmasters hand motions. We should oh, have yeah. universal health care. We should have he, universal health care, but it shouldn't be a kind so of health care like, that he's kicks giving up 150 halfway through. million Americans <laughs> off their health care. That's not smart policy. Okay, uh, Hassan, how fun was that? I mean, that's incredible. Uh, it's incredible until you realize that his net worth is $92 million, and that's precisely why he's upholding the interests of the pharmaceutical and insurance industry. But it is hilarious, and it is also uh, kind of inspirational. It's good to see. Uh, when I, when I, I mean, I love to see it. When I see uh, the, the California Democrats booing uh, someone for speaking out against uh, socialized medicine, I'm happy. I, I loved it because... California Democrats are the really wealthy ones for the most part, aren't they? Uh, they're the ones that uh, they're the ones that Hillary Clinton visits and Nancy Pelosi and everyone else visits when they want to raise money at their two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollar dinner. That's true, so, but I bet there is a true. lot of nurses union people and a lot of really solid grassroots people on the floor. And you know, you're totally right though, because I think even a guy like John Delaney is so delusional that he has, that's the terms he thinks of. He doesn't think of all of the grassroots democratic organizations in California, of union people, of advocates, of people who care about real things for real people, he is thinking like, hey, this is, you know, these are some of the people who might actually write me a check, even though I'll get like, a, you know, less than a rounding error in, in, in Iowa before I drop out. But he's so delusional and insulated that he actually goes to a grassroots gathering and thinks like, oh, yeah, but they're all just like the Democrats that you were talking about that people like him and Hillary Clinton associate with California. Exactly. And now, you know, I don't know. Hickenlooper was kind of like doing the like he was sort of like I felt like he was kind of like a vice principal sort of excuse me, uh, Delaney and Hickenlooper. I don't know, man. Delaney Delaney gave up and was deflated, but he was still kind of like a jerk about it. And Hickenlooper seems even more deflated to me Let, let's check this, this one but out. before we get yeah, to go the ahead. Tell me. one yeah, can tell i just me. say one more thing about delaney yes please what's really interesting to me about the dynamic there of getting booed in, in that fashion in front of the california democrats is that it, it's so obvious to me and to anyone who does punditry on the left that 
Democrats just refuse, like Democratic politicians just refuse to listen to their constituents. It's so obvious. I mean, these things are polling incredibly well. I mean, these things, these ideas like uh, $15 minimum wage, Medicare for all. I mean, they, they're they're they have overwhelming majority support in the country, even free college, free educate, uh, free education. Like, and yet they refuse to advocate for them at the legislative level because they understand that their their focus is entirely made up of of the same corporate interests that the Republican focuses on. But they have to pay lip service. At least the Republicans have found an effective way to do culture war stuff and and listen to their constituents and be like, look, we're we're not going to give you we're going to give you tax cuts. Shut up. You're going to like it. It'll be fine. Uh, you're poor. It'll hurt you in the long run, but you don't know that. It doesn't matter. But also the immigrants, they're terrible. Like they do everything they can to appease their constituencies, whereas Democrats so frequently deny that very same thing and ex- and, and expect people to vote for them on the virtue that they are not the Republicans. And this is precisely why, despite the fact that Democrats have the majority uh, in the population, there are more Democratic voters in this nation than there are Republicans, they keep losing elections. Obviously, there are different reasons for it as well, but I think the most important reason here is the fact that they refuse to actually do things that their constituents want. Oh, I think you're 100% right. And there's that old, I think it's something like Republicans fear their voters, Democrats disdain theirs. Um, you're 100% right. And here's John Hickenlooper, again, just with that total disrespect and delusion that Hassan's talking about. Socialism is not the answer. I was reelected. I was reelected in a purple state in 2014, one of the worst years for Democrats in a quarter century. I was, you know, if we're not careful, we're going to end up helping to reelect the worst president in American history. We should not oh, try God. to tackle climate change by guaranteeing every American a government job. Oh, fuck you, dude. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> leadership i mean yeah integrity honesty courage is <laughs> is drinking fracking juice that that there's no there's do we the have that why, just i yeah, don't know if we I mean, have it but explain to people explain to people what you're talking about though what what do you mean when uh, you say in an, drink- sh- in an effort to show that uh fracking juice uh, that the water that they use to to pump out oil from every crevice of the uh, ground uh that that is shown to taint the water supply in an effort to make that in an effort to act like that was just simply a myth uh, hickenlooper drank uh, frack juice oh we got it this is john hickenlooper drinking this is the guy socialism is not the answer but being such a grotesque shill for companies that destroy our drinking water uh fracking come fracking he drank it he dr- <laughs> oh wait we don't have it oh he can't play it all right let's forget it. so john hickenlooper uh, drank. What did you say, Hassan? What was the line? Fracking cum. Tell Frack- me that's not alpha as shit, though. Tell me that's not. I was gonna say that's... that's not big dick energy. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's as big dick energy as John Hickenlooper is is capable of. Uh, especially look yeah. at it's, it's looking. He's just the Greenpeace guy. The Greenpeace guy. For those of you who have seen the new Ace Bomber video, if you haven't, go check that out on um, definitely. Uh, like on how people lie about. Uh, climate change, like how Republicans lie about that. The Greenpeace, the ex-Greenpeace guy who is now a climate change denier, very famous one, uh, gets caught in this French interview where they're like, where he's advocating for uh, Roundup and how Roundup doesn't cause cancer. And uh, and he even goes so far as to say, like, I'll drink a Roundup. Like, I, I would even drink it to prove to you uh, that it's not uh, dangerous. And then the guy's like, well, we have it right here. Do you want to do that? Like, do you want to drink this Roundup? And he's like, no, of course not. I wouldn't do that. I'm not an idiot. And and Hickenlooper, respect for him. I will drink the Roundup because if I don't, Donald Trump will get reelected. Uh, Hassan, thanks for doing this, brother. Will you do it again sometime? Oh, of course, absolutely. Let me know whenever, man. This was awesome. And everybody who's in my chat right now on Twitch, um, go subscribe to the Michael Brooks Show. It's awesome. Michael Brooks has, uh, I mean, awesome guests. Unlike myself, he has like actually intelligent guests. Uh, and and go uh, well i've been on your show stream. on patreon i've been on your stream hassan 
mean, you have well, no, at least saying, some smart guests. Guest but there are actually. Oh, stop with the fucking self deprecation. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> I don't buy it. It's awesome having you on. Stop that shit. It's nonsense. There's more stuff for us to do in the future. I really appreciate it. We got to get after, I think, Crowder and Tim Pool. We got to talk more about Turkey and socialism and how we win. At some point, I want to do something with you, me, and, uh, and Brendan from the discourse. A lot of plans. Talk to you soon, brother. All right. Thanks, All right. man. Thanks, man. Take care. We'll get back to this, but at the moment, we're going to do our special new uh, – we have a new um, – segment on this program uh we don't have any special music for it sadly but why don't we just um it's this it's our um it's our cracker and cheese segment huh we got him and uh, our first guest on our new crackers and cheese segment is Hassan Pike. Hello, Hassan. Uh, welcome. Congratulations. What's going on? I just wanted to say uh, hello from a fellow cracker. Uh, from a cracker to another. We don't have any cheese today, uh, but this is uh, because we didn't do it. But so we do have the crackers. Um, so, dude, you got banned from from Twitch. I sure did. I I, I got a fat seven day uh, ban from Twitch for. Uh, my usage of the horrific, racially charged, incendiary, and absolutely unacceptable term, cracker. I think we're getting your um, your uh, your computer uh, audio, not your microphone. Oh, hold on. Let me change it up real quick. Wow. See, I get banned and I forget how to stream. Yeah, See that? Um, incidentally, today is uh, Crunch Master, multi-seed. The original. We don't. We don't get any type of uh, promotional support from this at all. We oh, just. Yeah. We just, you just love, you're just doing it for this. As you guys get in the game, you just love the crackers. Wait, uh, how how does this sound now? Does it sound good? That sounds great. great. Um, now listen, I am of the mind that uh, terms of service are the business of these private companies. Um, but there seems to me to be a difference between the n-word and the c-word as <laughs> <laughs> are we are we doing that we're, we're just gonna say the c-word i mean we don't know which c-word we're talking about because there's other words yeah. to say with the c-word and the reason why we don't know really is because there is not a long history of the use of the term crackers um that has been associated with subjugating an entire segment of the population right like words have a meaning that is um that is in invested in them by experience words in and of themselves mean nothing it's it, it really is like you know some type of a, a, of, a of established history uh but what's your take on that well, I have a lot of takes on that. I've been, as a matter of fact, uh, part of the reason why I did get banned is because I would not stop with my takes on this issue. But I'll just say this. If you say the C word and there's like eight other words that come to mind before cracker, then I'm pretty sure even if it's uh, a part of the, well, you know, Webster's dictionary definition of slurs that target a race, uh, it's, it's probably not, uh, you know, bad enough that it's ban worthy, which was my point to begin with, because I think that it's capitulating to white fragility and white identity politics, which goes against solidarity and, uh, you know, solidarity among classes. And I think that uh, it's, it's totally silly. And all of the people that uh, freaked out on me on Reddit and on Twitter are now doing touchdown dances and also making fun of how like, you know, silly this was like, oh man, I'm so glad we banned him for, you know, we got him banned for saying the C word. It's just classic old Gamergate era 4chan style, uh, you know, politics from edgelords. All right. So, I mean, give me your sense, like in terms of, uh, of a term of service, do you think like the, uh, you know, the N word should be allowed by um, 
Twitch or YouTube? I mean, no, sh- of course not. No, of course not. I believe that if a word is not associated with historical or contemporary systemic oppression and subjugation, then it's just it's just a slur that isn't as powerful and therefore is not the same. Like you can apply the blanket terminology of what a slur is, right, to it. And and slur is a very powerful word in and of itself. So immediately when you're like, well, that's a slur. That's a racial slur. You're like, whoa, what the fuck? That's crazy. Technically it is. But given the the loose definition of what white is, given the etymology of the word cracker itself, and just like you mentioned, uh, how it's devoid of any sort of like tangible and legitimate oppression, both historically and even in contemporary society, it's the same as redneck, hillbilly, uh, Karen, and numerous other kinds of, uh, you know, targeted, uh, uh, targeted slurs, I guess, pejoratives. I mean, this is, this is sort of, you know, what, 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 what my point is when I got fired from, uh, um, uh, MSNBC for using the term rape in a, um, a a satirical tweet that I did years before. And people were like, you know, there was, uh, and, and I felt like, no, I mean, uh, MSNBC has the right to fire me if they want to fire me. I mean, it's their, uh, their, their company. Uh, I thought it was wrong. People came to me and were like, well, how come you're not defending, you know, uh, Jeffrey Lord, who was a CNN guy at the time, who was, I don't know, making Nazi comments. And I'm like, because I don't think his comment (laughs) was equivalent to mine. Um, Like you can, there can be a class of things that people can make a determination about, and there can be a difference within that class of, of, of language. It's not, I don't feel that people should be fired uh, for language one way or another, or they should be banned for language one way or another. It's a function of the instance and the language in and of itself. And in this instance, there is a big difference between the N-word and the cracker word, uh, as it were, because like yeah. you say, of the history and, and, and the meaning behind, that's what meaning of words means it doesn't just mean what it, it, there's context to it and um you know anybody who could read my tweet understood the context in that joke i wasn't actually saying that i get to choose who uh rapes my uh daughter i was making a satirical point about people trying to apologize essentially for a rapist and yeah yeah there's context and uh, you know i i think twitch has the uh, ability and youtube has the ability to um to decide what their terms of service are but you can also sort of say like they're wrong on certain issues uh and they're wrong in this case as far as i can tell and by the way for the record i've long been an advocate for the twitch terms of service as a matter of fact it's something that i believe is the reason why that platform is overall a lot better and a lot safer for content creators, even though there are hate raids and whatnot that goes on. And I've said this, even though I've gotten, uh, you know, unfairly banned numerous times, like for example, when I showed like gore, they considered it to be gore because I was showing Michael Moore's like a Bowling for Columbine um, uh, documentary when I was describing American imperialism and, you know, all of the war crimes that America engaged in in Latin American countries. So, um, Despite the fact that I've been on the receiving end of many bans, some worthy, some understandable, Dan Crenshaw, some not so uh, understandable, like the thing I just mentioned, or Cracker, I think that their rigorous application of the terms of service, in comparison to other platforms, of course, that's not still not like perfect, very difficult job, is the reason why there's uh, a lot less hate speech that goes on on Twitch than other platforms and other comparable platforms like even YouTube, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, YouTube is working on it too, don't get me wrong, but for the past 10 years when I was working at the Young Turks, and even uh, now, my number one issue with YouTube has always been white supremacist radicalization on the platform and how much white supremacists and Nazis can literally use the platform itself. Twitch, not so much because they do ban you, but they go too far. I do still prefer it, though. Um. Yeah, and I think, like, you know, they can make a... Uh, the, these are situations where I think they could revisit and and sort of uh, get a better and more sophisticated understanding of what's going on. I mean, it's not like these are, you know, it's not like bots, 
right? I mean, these are human beings making these decisions and human brains have a certain nimbleness that an algorithm theoretically does not have. And a, um, a human brain can say the term cracker just does not mean and have the same implications as the N word in this country, even though they are both, you know, racial insults or slurs. And um, and and I, I I would think that someone would have the you know the nimbleness of, of mind to to make that distinction. But um, I, you I know, mean, I, no, I I agree. The problem is that there is a lot of outrage that you can almost mathematically create on the internet, right? This is the age-old argument. This is something that people on the internet that love doing debates. A lot of the people that call into your show and say, Sam, I don't know. I'm a libertarian. Like those are the same dudes who on the one hand love arguing about being able to say the N word as a white guy. And then on the other hand, love talking about white fragility and how white people are actually oppressed and white people are oppressed, just not on the virtue of being white. There's right. no historical oppression or contemporary oppression attached to being white. That doesn't mean you're not oppressed. If you're not, you know, if you're gay, if you are, you know, a member of the LGBT community, you, you can be marginalized in different ways as a white man, right? But, and most importantly, and most significantly, in my opinion, uh, on the virtue of your class, if you're poor, you were born into a poorer family, if you're destined to be a worker for the rest of your life, then yes, you are going to experience a fuckload of alienation, a fuckload of oppression, but that's not because you're white. And I, I stress that regularly, but that's a really difficult concept for people who have, you know, who've grown up with liberal politics to, to comprehend. And unfortunately, oppressors and uh, people who are in the dominant group regularly will use these sorts of uh, liberal institutions and their liberal understandings of certain concepts to, you know, get their way. They can they can say cracker really offends me. I'm I'm a white guy, and then actually get their way while simultaneously laughing about it and saying the n word even when they're you know attacking people for saying the, the word cracker. What is your uh, what is your overall perspective on this idea of uh, you know the uh, the deplatforming and 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 that type of stuff just generally? I'm curious as to that because that has been like an ongoing debate that we've had on this program. I think for years the idea of like nationalizing these platforms. I mean, uh, or um, or in 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 my opinion, we should be breaking up um, these these uh tech monopolies so that the implications of getting deplatformed from any given one are not so huge so um we're fully in agreement that uh you know destroying these tech monopolies is the best possible way to go i'm you know i hate the monopolization of the every sector of the american economy shouts out to ronald reagan um but as far as deplatforming i i do think it's a, a very successful method of stopping harmful ideas from spreading. Um, I understand that, uh, you know, when we start talking about like who gets to make that decision and that's terrible. Yeah. They demonstrably, these platforms demonstrably make bad decisions on a regular basis on these issues. So I guess you're right. Um, breaking up these tech monopolies would at least at the very least, like kind of divvy up, uh, that power a little bit so you could go somewhere else and you're not just like relegated to bit shoot or something, even though those are usually the Nazis and shit that go there. Right. Um, but uh, no, deplatforming, I think, can be completely understandable, completely reasonable and successful. Radicalization is a real thing. Stochastic terror is a real thing. These are real concepts. Is the FBI using like a loose terminology for it or are they actually actively pursuing like some? You know, people that they declare white supremacists, uh, certainly. Will it ever turn into, you know, the post-Patriot Act world in, in which, like, how Muslims were targeted? Most likely not. Um, Spencer Ackerman talks about this extensively in Reign of Terror. Um, so I, I think deplatforming works, and it can be viable, and it can be uh, appropriate. And most people, unless they have, like, a Noam Chomsky-style approach, or a, I guess Glenn Greenwald is can't really consider him to be principled anymore, but like a Noam Chomsky style approach, if you're a free speech absolutist, that's one thing. But the overwhelming majority of people understand that, uh, you know, there is, there are boundaries to free speech. 
there are boundaries to free speech in the sense that even in America, which has the most liberal free speech rules, right? Uh, there are still boundaries on what you can and can't say. And I think those boundaries are appropriate for society to function. Um, and I think hate speech should be part of those boundaries. Absolutely. And we should say, I mean, I, you know, um, I, I, I think I don't know that. And maybe again with, with Chomsky, it may be different, but uh, the, um, the absolutists when it comes to free speech, I don't think would, would be in favor. I mean, certainly not um, uh, uh, Glenn and with his libertarian leanings would be um, happy with the government <laughs> essentially regulating that these private corporations should allow for no, no terms of service. I mean, starts getting that a has never happened and that will never happen. Of course. When you have no terms of service, you turn into Gab or you turn into Parlor, which ironically still do have a terms of service. And, and also those platforms become hotbeds for pedophiles, Nazis, and in a lot of instances, pedophile Nazis. So <laughs> that's, you know, and, uh, and also liberals don't want to frequent those platforms. So even Republicans and conservatives that want to own the libs don't like going to those platforms anymore because then there's no libs to own there. Exactly. Just a bunch of pedophile Nazis talking to one another about the white race. And that gets really boring after a while, right? You have to be really invested in racism to, to enjoy those platforms. That shows so, how people are the problem with free speech, right? Like, no, that thing about, like, nobody wants to go to Gab because, like, it's all Nazis. Like, no normal person would go there. Like, we think about going there just for, like, the confrontation, maybe. Right. But, like, yeah. yeah they're, they're not, they aren't compatible for free speech, no matter how much they cry about um, it, um, how much they're the def real defenders of it while they, like, are happy when you get banned from Twitch, for instance. Well, one of the problems is there is no innovation in the white supremacy sector these days. They are not coming up with new theories. It is just, <laughs> they just keep playing the hits over and over again. There is just hey, some, why, no- Why it, fix it if it ain't broke, Sam? <laughs> exactly. Um, well, all right, so let's, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, if there's, uh, uh, you know, the, you're gonna be back on Twitch in what, like a couple of days? How many days do they, uh, they give you a timeout for? Seven. Seven days. That's how yeah, long? Which is, which is yeah. like a lot longer than like most bands. <laughs> it's like the second law. I mean, there's PERMA, there's a 30 day ban, and then there's a seven day ban. But most bands are usually around like a one day or three day bands. You can appeal it, but I don't think they're going to allow me to. Yeah, three day ban. I'm just curious as to like the, 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 the cracker infringement. And of course, I'm, when I say cracker, I'm, I'm talking about uh, crackers. But yeah, the, of course. Crackers infringement. Where does that like? What would you do to get a two-day ban on Twitch, and what would you do to get a thirty-day ban? I'm just curious as to where that falls in the spectrum. Well, uh, I don't. I can't say because this is a part of the process that they uh, basically keep uh, a complete secret. I don't know who any of the moderators on that team specifically are. We never know. Mo people at which that work within the company, I think in some instances don't even know. So they, they it's like a, it's like a group of people that, you know, are basically the gatekeepers and usually they do a pretty good job. Like, don't get me wrong. I am a, I, I am understanding of what they have to do. I just, and I do think that the cracker discourse is a unique one because it's one that you can very easily use against liberals, right? Especially, this is like BDS, right? Uh, like, people love white supremacists and people who are engaging in white identity politics, whether they are white supremacists themselves or not, regularly utilize marginalized groups and their rhetoric effectively to dominate the conversation and to create oppression for themselves, to create a victimhood narrative for themselves. That's why you got the all lives matter to the black lives matter. That's why... You know, you have the the pro-lifers to the pro-choicers, right? Like, they're not saying we're pro-forcing your pregnancy to term. They're saying they're pro-life. Um, that's why you have Blue Lives Matter. So they're, they're very effective at using liberal academic language uh, in a cynical capacity to kind of win over liberals in the margins who may or may not have been, uh, I don't know, captivated by or at the very least, like, nurtured into 
believing certain white supremacist uh, values growing up in a country like America. America is very racist. And all of our institutions churn out that information, whether it is white supremacists through omission, like not educating people on certain concepts, or overtly white supremacists by saying stuff like, you know, the Civil War was the war of Northern aggression. You know, that that's these are all very profoundly important ways in which people are educated to to recognize white plight and white oppression as a unique struggle, whether they recognize it or not. And this impacts not just white people, but even even black people, even, uh, you know, black and brown people that grow up within this education system are going to sympathize with these, some of these values because it's the dominant attitude. I mean, I think to some extent that's what's going on with this, you know, anti-CRT in the classrooms thing. I mean, and, and it's starting to, um, it is, it's an attempt to sort of, um, vic, you know, uh, create this notion that, that white people are being victimized, um, by both mischaracterizing critical race theory and lying about where it's being taught for that matter. Uh, frankly, I would like to see it in the, uh, you know, I think you could probably develop a program that, that would be appropriate for elementary school kids. It would be important. Um, it's interesting too. I think that there is a, what's fascinating is that you're starting to see now coming out of this anti CRT stuff. I think it was something in the American conservative I read that was, uh, essentially trying to reestablish the Dunning School, which is the sort of uh, prevalent um, historical interpretation of Reconstruction, trying to reassert that because they're now claiming that uh, the, that it is wrong to reprint, I think Du Bois' uh, um, um, uh, Reconstruction, the book, they're complaining about this now. I mean, this is where it's traveling to, right? Like they, they Oh yeah, but, it's always going to expand because there's no it's never going to end with cracker. It's a ridiculous take regardless. Uh it will as long as you as long as you continue uh recognizing this as like a unique form of oppression and that's very real. As long as you make, you know, white identitarians feel valid about their plight, even if they are totally antagonizing and totally uh creating a false victimhood narrative deliberately and cynically, um, they will continue to make gains as, and you see it like that's how Charlottesville, that's how we got the Charlottesville. Like you give them an inch and they, you know, they take a mile. Uh, and ultimately I, I suspect like, you know, calling someone a Nazi, for example, uh, you could totally make the argument that this is a racially charged term. I mean, this is most of the time it's being used towards white people. It's, uh, you know, you, and I think it's oppressive. I, I wasn't a part of the, you know, Nazi party in 1938. That's ridiculous that you're calling me a white person a Nazi. I think you should be banned for it. You know, this is, there, there's the endless opportunity there. And, and, and again, the, the issue is just sort of, you know, context matters. The, the, the most weaponized I remember a cracker ever being used in my lifetime was on episodes of, I think, the Jeffersons um, against the, the neighbors who would come by. But they were all actors, and it was a sitcom, and they were all paid, and they were, it was just written in the dialogue. Yeah, I mean, I've just, I, I personally have never met, and, and I myself have been called Cracker many times, going after, like, different fandoms, uh, you know, shouts out to the Barbs out there, if you're watching, Sam. Um, you know, I've been called a cracker many times, many, many times, definitely more times than most of the people crying about being called a cracker uh, on the internet. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a, it's a ridiculous thing. It's not dehumanizing. It's not, it's, well, it's, no it's not associated with any sort of like serious, uh, uh, oppression. Um, all right. Well, I mean, I think, um, I mean, if, if we've covered all that, I'm, I'm curious on your uh, perspective on some other things that are going on in the, in the news today. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a segue there that, you know, we can engage in. Apparently, uh, the, the libertarian brain, uh, ooh, that, that defense project Veritas, doesn't actually end up defending a, uh, a white guy getting banned for saying cracker. Uh, he, you know, Glenn Greenwald came out with a, well, what I goes around comes around, not, a... I, not seen the the tweet where he is defending you uh, against Twitch on this. 
Has he? No, he he did not. He said, "What goes around comes around." <laughs> that's all. This that's all. This has been setting up for. I, my opinion is coming when the event, eventual purge comes. That's what I think. That I mean, that's like the functional equivalent of 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 cheering on. You know, saying that unvaccinated should not go to the hospitals, right? I mean, like the whole his whole brand has been an unwavering principled uh principle stance regardless of who the players well, are maybe i mean i don't know if greenwell but that principle was a bit shaky around the nathan robinson guardian thing too among some other of those sub stackers like taking a little bit of victory laps or uh, look at uh, uh a little bit gleeful at a leftist getting banned well all right let's uh well the thing the thing about that is like glenn is uh, ridiculous in this issue because like he knows for a fucking fact that I have been a massive advocate for, you know, BDS protesters and how much of a disgusting uh, erosion of the First Amendment laws that we supposedly have uh, in this country. Whenever you know you have to sign like that, you've never <laughs> you've to sign like loyalty to the state of Israel and that you've never actually said Palestinians are human to be a fucking teacher in Texas. Like I think that's insane. And, well, and that is a true restriction of freedom of speech. I just want to be clear so that people understand what you're talking about. There are, I think, some like 20 states in the country, maybe there's more, where to get a contract from the state, whether you're a speech therapist helping kids in public school or whether you're, I don't know, supplying, a, you know, a, a toilet paper for the, the state house bathrooms, you need to sign a pledge to say that you will not engage in the politic, the the constitutionally protected right to protest or um, or boycott Israeli products, there are twenty some odd states that, that that make you sign this. the The Republicans tried to push this on a federal level. I think it was Marco Rubio uh, a couple of years ago brought it up in the Senate. Um, and yeah, it's obscene. It's absolutely obscene. And that is genuine first amendment stuff because of course we're talking about the government. Um, and, uh, so I just wanted to, if people weren't aware of that. Yeah. He, he basically said that Glenn basically said, you know, pro censorship, pro li like liberals being pro censorship will lead to this. And he, and he basically said banning people for the not basically, I'm reading a tweet. Banning people for using the term cracker is obviously demented and repressive, but the ultimate case for reaping and sowing. It is incredibly easy to predict, and many tried warning that banning people like Milo and Alex Jones would inevitably lead to this outcome. So this idea that, like, uh, you know, people are getting banned for saying cracker uh, was inevitably going to happen is, is a silly one, considering that, like, platforms were incredibly strict on on anything that goes outside of like the liberal to reactionary, uh, uh, you know, neat little ideological box of conformity for a very long time. You, you never were able to, you know, you, you would get clapped as a, as a defender of Palestine regularly, even before Alex Jones and Milo was, was, of uh, course. Look at off the platform. Hill. I mean, you know, yeah. platform, but I mean, and, and, and we should say that, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, um, he was about 30. Uh, Barry Crimmins was in front of uh, Congress. The, the late Barry Crimmins was testifying about uh, pedophiles on AOL. Uh, when that was, when, and that was a platform and they were, they were, they had chat rooms and uh, they were allowing, uh, you know, um, uh, child predators on there. And it got shut down and the, you wouldn't hear any arguments at that time. Like this is a slippery slope. The fact of the matter is, is that there people can make a difference between uh, peddling, uh, you know, one type of stuff versus another. And that th those type of assessments are made all the time. And there's inevitably going to be mistakes like I think Twitch made in your case. Um, and that's part of the process. And that's part of like the the way that these things develop and the idea yeah. that they're all the same because you're 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 deplatforming a person and so they're in it's necessarily all the same case it's childish and and it really is less and i think it's indicative of just his response to you frankly it is um less 
about a principled stance and more about like this is just the cho the the methodology he's using to advocate for a certain ideology that he obscures and yeah. i mean you, you i wonder if he thinks that mccarthyism is uh, is a product of you know liberal identity politics as well maybe that's why it happened <laughs> Yeah, Red scare happened only because you know the left wanted too much censorship. <laughs> of course, of course. I mean, he will, he will, he will use. I mean, and and you know, it's been the the. It, 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 this is his methodology, and I think it's it's quite clear. And I will say this though, um, we're getting a lot of complaints about your fingernail polish, and uh, I think yeah. it is very. I think it was it was very big of us to allow you on. Uh, Thank you. Despite my be, me being weird, it's, weird guy, a lot of people in the in the, in the office are totally freaked out right now, and um, that was really funny. And I have to say, also, I mean, I didn't actually think that we would go into this, uh, but um, I guess we both couldn't help ourselves. Um, the fact that he took offense that you were saying that uh, that he and Jimmy are old, and I and I will say this. <laughs> Glenn is, as far as I know, probably about six months younger than I, and uh, maybe less, maybe four or five. I think he's, I think he's, he's maybe not quite hit fifty-five yet. We are old. <laughs> I want to make that clear. We're old. Fifty-five is old. You're, you're a fox, Sam. You know that. Well, that that may or may not be the case, and uh, Glenn is a strapping, uh, a, a, a young uh, a, a well, looking fellow, young. not young, but old <laughs> fellow as well. And Jimmy, you know, um, but we're old. You're young. That's just a fact. And I think you know it's important for us to sort of just accept it and not. It's not uh, pejorative. It just happens to be that like when you get to be our age. You just certain things look like you're on our lawn, and it's upsetting to us. Um, but that's you know, it's, it's I, just it, it is like it doesn't matter how old you are if you start freaking out on someone because they have their because it's like a straight dude, straight male has like painted their nails a color. Then that's like, boomer oh. behavior. Boomerism is a mindset, and those commercials. And like the uh, couple is in like the Home Depot or whatever and the guy with blue hair and he's like, don't, you don't have to say anything about the blue hair and the dad can't help himself. That's the, the same behavior. It, it, it's, it's pretty shocking. I mean, like it, it's not, I got to say, and I'm not, I'm not a boomer. I don't think, um, uh, well, Glenn couldn't be because he is like five or six young uh, months uh, younger than me. But, you know, even boomers, we, we've had Plenty of people in our generation, in Gen X, who wear nail polish. It just seems like, I mean, like a very odd thing to fixate on. Uh, but I guess that was what the, the reach is. Who do you think they're yeah. on? Now? I mean, do you think What's they up? just like basically are in competition with, with Steven Crowder in terms of their audience? I think that there's a lot of... Look, the, the, there's a big audience in independent media always that is constantly looking for reactionary content and people to tell them that they agree with them. It's, uh, I think, even better if this is supposedly like a leftist person or a left adjacent person telling a reactionary person that they agree with them. Like everyone wants to be comforted for their points of view. So, um, you know, it's a, it's certainly uh, a it's certainly a viable way to make money. I think that's, I, I think it's an immoral way to do so, but that's, that's probably what they're cashing in on. I mean, a lot of these guys, they get bad sub stacks, uh, you know, decent amount of money. Um, I know Glenn loves talking about how much money I make whenever that comes up, but like I'm one person, like we don't have a lot of incredibly successful leftist media operations that are independent, you know? We, uh, are, we don't even have a lot of leftist media operations in general in comparison to how broad the spectrum of like reactionary content that is readily available on YouTube that is sometimes independent and other times actually backed by the very same institutions, entities, human beings that would back mainstream media outlets that uh, churn that kind of misinformation. It's pretty um, stunning what, what you're talking. I mean, like we will every now and then hear about somebody that we have never heard about 
Uh, the last one was this guy, J.P. Sears. I just had a, a, a thing. Do you, have you ever heard of J.P. Sears? No. He is a conservative, anti-vaccine comic who gets like 2 million views <laughs> per video he puts out about this, you know, with, with anti-vax conservative uh, talking points. Oh, I know. That dude looks hurt. Yo, that... Yeah. That dude, oh my god, he looks like such a fucking. That dude is the typical, is the archetypical Los Angeles failed actor who absolutely fucking was like, oh, there's a there's a target rich environment of suckers here that'll like watch anything I say as long as they agree with me, and like it's such bottom of the barrel commentary. It's just like liberals are so stupid. It's like the what's that fucking SNL guy that was uh, on with uh, Dave Chappelle in that movie, Jim Brewer or whatever. Like oh, it, it's, it, it, actually. Yeah, it's his, it's his style of comedy where he's like, liberals are like this. And then everyone's like, yes, I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's just, uh, you know, it's the, it's the reactionary version of, of, uh, Nanette and I, it sucks. Yeah. I mean, I guess my point was that there's, there's a ton of these, uh, guys out there. Now we here are swimming in, uh, drowning in Google money. Uh, as most people know, uh, completely drowning in it. But for the but for the most part, there's really a very limited uh, number of people who do this on the left and can actually make a living at it. I, I, I was fortunate enough to come off of of Air America, and I had an email list, and that was basically the only thing that basically saved me t- uh, 10, 11 years ago. Um, but for the most part, very difficult to build an audience on the, uh, on the, on the left, whether it's, um, the, you know, whether it's, you're, you're talking about liberals or you're talking about progressives or socialists, it's tough. It happens, but it's tough. And, um, on the right, there's just a lot more money and there's a lot more, frankly, you know, um, uh, uh funding that comes from places like, uh, the Koch brothers, maybe it gets, it gets laundered a couple of times through different organizations, and uh, but there's a lot of money out there. There's a lot of lost leader um, attitude on the right that doesn't exist on the left, obviously, because, you know. Um, yeah, the, the, I don't know why someone who has uh, been a beneficiary of uh, wealth hoarding or, or the centralization of wealth would turn around and, and pay for someone. Um, to, to tell them like that that's wrong, that that entire system that allowed them to make billions of dollars and, and accumulate that kind of wealth is that system needs to be dismantled. They're not going to do that. Uh, people it, who benefit from that are not going to turn around and pay for people to, to advocate against that. Even on Air America, the, the, the big money was afraid of giving money to Air America and supporting it, investing in it, because the, the big money... The liberal, you know, center to the to the left money is afraid of populism because the populism on the left is economic populism. The uh, the folks like the Koch brothers or the 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 countless number of uh, of of billionaires, frankly, that fund these things every day. You hear about another uh, person who's like three hundred million dollars for you know uh, to invest in some type of seed thing for for online uh, right wing content. They're not afraid of the right-wing populism because it doesn't threaten their dollars <laughs> at the end of the day. They don't criticize venture capitalism. No. And even when you look at like what, you know, the, the critique that, that Glenn has of, of big tech, he will pay some lip service to the idea of dismembering it, but it really becomes which flavor of big tech is evil, right? Google is evil. PayPal's not necessarily evil. Uh, Facebook's not necessarily evil. I mean, even in w- what's also fascinating to me is like, you know, I remember interviewing him about his book about the, the Manichaean style of the Bush administration, good, evil, how childish he thought that was at the time. But now it's effective because it's really deployed as a way of building a brand and these subsidiary brands, whether it's Substack or rumble or whatever call in or whatever it is. Um, and instead of saying there's a structural problem here that needs to be dealt with, and this is the this is the point. It's not that Google is evil or Facebook is evil. It is these 
anything of this size, any enterprise of this size is bad for society. It's not like these specific you know, individuals there are evil. Maybe they are, but that's irrelevant. It is the structure of these things that needs to be dealt with. Absolutely. Um, just like the, the systemic problems will still persist, and there is a big difference that I, I always like to point to when we're looking at cultural hegemony, right? Um, bad behavior uh, and, and like policing what you would consider to be like bad thoughts and bad attitudes in liberal media is something that a lot of liberals also like to engage in, rad libs. And I criticize that too, to a certain degree, when people are just like, why is there a bad character doing bad things in this movie? That's bullshit. They should always do, you know, human beings should not be complex. They should be arbiters of morality and yada, yada. And I think that's a silly way. And I think that that's bad for art overall. And I don't like that. And, uh, and I personally don't even think that like uh, uh, these, these cultural movements actually end up uh, pushing for systemic change. I, I, I will admit that. Okay. They're the only time, however, though, that like uh, any sort of art cultural artifact, a movie, for example, like Birth of a Nation, can push for uh, some kind of, uh, you know, attitude shift is if the material realities already support that. America was already a wh deeply white supremacist nation. We already have a lot of white supremacist institutions. And then Birth of a Nation happens. That's how you start, you know, uh, uh, that's how you start basically uh, uh, forming uh, a, an active base for the Klan, right? That can't happen with the opposite. You can't combat material realities and material inequalities by making people watch a movie and then, you know, feel a certain type of way. You can only do that if you are already in the dominant group and that your ideology is baked into all of the institutions and your attitude is reflected in like everyday lives, uh, in our everyday lives, even if people don't recognize it's happening. So That's how nefarious it is. You're saying that these, these uh, cultural forces can be accelerants, but they cannot be, um, you know, uh, they can't, they, they can't flip, uh, be catalysts and, 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 and flip. Yes. Uh, the, yeah. yes. I think that's true. The, the, the revolutionary spark can only happen if there is a base of support if, if, within the material inequalities and that there is like already organizing occurring um, alongside that. It can't do it on its own. No one's going to watch a movie and be like, all right, I'm fucking Marxist now. And like, you know, and then enough people watch it and then they all become, uh, you know, Marxists. And then that's how you form the Vanguard Party. Like, that's not how it happens. It happens at workplaces. It happens at, through organizing. And, and I, th I think that th that limitation is, this, is, is true for the, the type of stuff that we do, frankly, as well. Like the, the, the there has been because, you know, um, the, uh, of the nature of, I think, the people who do this kind of stuff that we do and, 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 and the, the, the economic incentives to sort of inflate our um, influence in, in this sphere. I mean, I think I mean, you have a much bigger audience, obviously, than 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 uh, than we do here. But um, even even there, it is it is you can influence um, ideas, but I I think ultimately there's no we're we're not we're not we're not catalysts for 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 broad based change that has to happen with people in their their real life uh, relationships and interactions and uh, workplace and their relationship to their own work. I, I, I you know, the idea that, you know, uh, the, that, that people are like, we don't have a certain policy because uh, th these five YouTubers are not behind it is, um, I, I think, a little bit problematic uh, in, in terms of, of people's understanding of how this stuff works. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's 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 funny to me whenever people uh, greatly exaggerate like the influence that I have even when they're like, oh, you're going to get the Democratic Party to not vote for Joe Biden if you keep criticizing him. And I'm like, if I could get people to vote a certain way, Bernie Sanders will be fucking the president. <laughs> you know, he would have won the primaries. <laughs> like, it's not my influence is, is nothing in comparison to the trillions of dollars of earned media 
that mainstream media outlets can offer a particular candidate if they want to shift their weight towards them. You know, I, I don't just mean paid media. I don't mean, you know, I'm using the technical definition here. Earned media is when someone talks about your candidate, for those of you who don't know, uh, in an organic capacity, like, oh, yeah, look how crazy it is that Joe Biden won Super Tuesday. That's wild. Like, or leading up to Super Tuesday. I'm talking about how great Joe Biden is. Like, that's earned media versus paid media would be uh, buying ads. It works side by side, but earned media is incredibly powerful. Yeah, I, I think the dynamic is 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 very similar to what you were talking about. Just you know, um, in terms of where the, the the culture is, we can be accelerants, we can be um, the reinforcers, we can we can help a little bit. But there's nobody. There's no. It's not happening with any given or even a multitude of 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 YouTubers. It's all just butterfly wings type of stuff. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't mean that like what we're doing is not significant. Don't get me wrong. I think you guys are doing a great job. And I think like trying to uh, break away from the capitalist dogma or even like the the um, center right liberal attitude that Americans have on a, on most economic issues. I think that's really good, um, but it can't be done uh, individually by YouTubers and Twitch streamers and podcasters. It has to be also accompanied with like on the ground organizing. Um, and, and, and stuff like, uh, uh you know, Matt was just uh, saying, you know, defense against like stuff like Pro project Veritas. I mean, we're, I think we're most effective when we're just talking about media narratives and, and where they start. I mean, that's the interesting thing I think about Twitter on some level too, is that, um, m much of what's happening on Twitter is really a function of influencing, the um the sense of reporters who are on twitter as to what's going on in the in the narrative i mean that's the sort of interesting dynamic you're you're, you're almost like taking advantage of the of of the myopia that that most human beings have which is like oh i heard a lot on twitter it must be going on out there and then you have people who actually have the ability to write like in the new york times and have a sense of what what's happening that very often cuts the other way because it's all about you know uh somebody at kenyan college uh said you can't uh, say this word and so that's the whether that's our biggest problem in this country or something to that effect but yeah, i hate that <laughs> Uh, I, I absolutely hate it because it's like uh, this idea that so many people who can, who fancy themselves to be like, uh, you know, white working class whispers exclusively hyper focus on the exact same kind of culture war bullshit that like reactionary outlets focus on like Fox News and think that that is the end all be all when it's like a dude living in Western Pennsylvania, uh, his life is not going to change uh, if like a couple students who were maybe even a little, uh, you know, heated, maybe a little over the top, uh, and, and we're yelling at a professor, you know what I mean? Like, that's not, it's not changing anybody's life. It's, it's just simply a distraction and they're doing it deliberately. They're distracting you from the main problems. They're distracting you from the reality that the Joe Biden administration hasn't done shit, but even Republicans aren't, uh, doing a better job of criticizing the Joe Biden administration. They're still hyper-focusing on made up narratives like CRT. And, and all this other shit. Why? Because if they were to hold Joe Biden to account, if they truly were economic populists, like, uh, you know, Donald Trump presented himself to be, but he wasn't actually, right? They would be hammering Joe Biden on student loan uh, debt relief. Where is it? Of course. Of Where's course. the student loan debt relief? They would be uh, even talking more about how Joe Biden is currently utilizing Title 42 and trying to keep Title 42 in action to ensure that you know, asylum seekers who are legally and morally, by the way, uh, seeking asylum within our borders, uh, purging them from the country by using the Donald Trump era CDC restrictions and, and uh, using this like COVID uh, uh, restrictions to purge them from the country without giving them their, their right to seek asylum. Uh, it's it's disgusting. Same dynamic with uh, Remain in Mexico. You had a court order that they needed to come to a deal with Mexico, but the idea that deals uh, can be sewn up so quickly it seems um, uh, fascinating to me. I mean, I, I don't know. There was a, there's a, uh, just 
Yeah, I, I will say this, and let, this actually raises something that I was going to talk about today. I hadn't, I didn't got to yet, but there was um, the Biden administration. Uh, you know, they 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 just held one of the biggest sales for auctions for oil and gl- gas drilling leases in the Gulf of Mexico's history, and uh, I think it was in in November, and uh, it happened literally just days after COP26. Is he listen to the scientists, Sam? That's how it works. And the uh, at the time. The administration said that we were compelled to by um, by a court ruling that um, was in favor of a bunch of Republican led states that sued to lift the, the 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 blanket pause that the administration had put on the drilling permits. Uh, but apparently, this according to the Guardian, the, uh, the the DOJ just before the lease acknowledged that the judgment does not force the government to auction off the drilling rights in the Gulf. I'm not going to, you know, I don't need to read what the DOJ says. That was just what it said. Now, here's the question I have. Um, I wonder, and I'm looking at this, there's also uh, a, a, a big fight at the FDIC right now, which, uh, long story short, there's a Republican Trump-appointed uh, chair of the FDIC, and there's a majority on the board of Democrats and they're having a big sort of like bureaucratic fight because the Democrats want to regulate the banks harder and want to prevent consolidation. There is the, the, the Biden administration that deserves communism who deserves credit for not quite communism, but for uh, antitrust They're They're pretty good on it in terms of the administration, in terms of the personnel. That story has sort of broken out into the open because it's pretty high profile. I, I, I wonder when I see stuff like this, whether this, uh, whether the Department of the Interior is still staffed by a lot of Trump appointed people who, when there's a court order, instead of dragging their feet, race, race to fulfill this thing before there is like, you know, because this is a massive our government has tens of thousands of people who who come in with a new administration or they don't. And we're still a year out dealing with a lot of these uh, these agencies that are Trump staffed. And the Biden administration just doesn't have the it's just it's just a sheer, you know, it's a difficult operation. I can't I've been trying to get you know, fricking pull over uh, hoodies on our merch site for seven months. And it takes me time to do it. Um, the, I, I, I don't know the answer to this, but well, uh, Republicans want it more. And also not only that, but, but also uh, they don't uh, go against the interest, the material interest of their benefactors, their corporate benefactors and their wealthy benefactors. Like that's the reality. Whereas Democrats, Uh, campaign yeah democrats campaign on systemic problems that they are seeking to solve that are diametrically opposed to the material interests of their benefactors which is precisely why they have to be the party of incompetence whereas republicans can be the party of viciousness and immorality uh and openly uh engage in like racial agitative propaganda white anxieties uh, you know, use that as a as a really effective uh, deflection away from the real problems that American working class, uh, the American working class is facing. Whereas uh, Democrats just look like incompetent fools that can only focus on, you know, making sure your favorite TV show doesn't have any like uh, uh, hateful sentiment expressed in it, even if it's uh, simply for, even if it's simply for parody. And I think that that is, just a really silly self-defeating way of of running and dem- let alone the reality that democrats only run every four years or every two years when they remember that they're you know they, they need to win seats versus republicans are running all the time because they have to activate certain key bases within their movement and are consistently hammering on uh their narratives otherwise how the hell are you going to get a bunch of random people to what advocate for tort reform you know what i mean or even school choice (laughs) like these are these are ideas that they add on to other pre-existing 
uh, uh, movements that are organically growing like QAnon. That's why when you see like a QAnon rally, you got like a Republican council member running for a fucking district in like Southern California, literally talking about uh, 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 school choice. And, but you're at a QAnon rally. And it's like, yeah, you know, Democrats are pedophiles. Also, we should give more vouchers. <laughs> you know, we should we should allocate some of this communist public schooling system funds away from these, you know, uh, horrible communist teachers and give them to private schools, religious schools. It's like, well, you just bake that in there so perfectly. And they do this year round. They do this nonstop because they want it more. And also because that's what the benefactors want. And that's what the benefactors want, even if they're actually, you know, giving money to the Democratic Party. And, 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 I, and I do think, it, you know, the, there's just a lot less friction between uh, school choice and QAnon than there is uh, between, you know, um, uh, funding public schools more and, um, and wealthy benefactors. I mean, that's just the bottom line. There's just, um, it, it is, it's, it's not as steep of a hill, I guess. All right, ma'am. Well, uh, listen, um, I guess uh, enjoy your vacation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to keep, I mean, I'm going to keep making content. Like, they're not going to, it's really annoying because uh, the, the band is like really rigorous, really, like you can't appear on anyone else's streams. You can't like basically have- limit you from hanging out with your friends and your coworkers, which is understandable. Are you not allowed to see family members? <laughs> no, I can see my family members. Yeah, my mom and dad are here right now. They're they're staying with me, but uh, you know, I'm I'm still gonna keep trucking away. Over when they heard about the band? No, they loved it. They were like, "Oh, great!" Like then you, we will be able to go and and vacation. I was like, "Absolutely not." <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right, well, hang in there. Thanks for coming on. It was good to. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. All right, we'll talk to you later. We are back and we are joined by Hassan Piker, who like I would plug his work, but you basically can just search the name Hassan and it's going to be one of the first things that comes up because you're kind of a big deal. Oh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. I'm like the third best Hassan at, at best. You know what I mean? We got Hassan Minhaj. We got, got Mehdi Hassan. I, uh, I, yeah, I'm the I one. Mean, I'm definitely the one that get canceled the most, though. Like I, I'm, I'm the one that comes up every week on Twitter on the trending tab, probably. Yeah, I didn't. Did I? I, I heard some rumors about you that you own a house. I do, and ever since, ever since that shit got leaked. Dude. Yeah, ever since that got leaked, things have just been on the downswing. Like no matter what I do, people are just like, "This guy's a bad guy." Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. I, 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 I uh, that that seems like sound logic. Um, we go back, uh, we, I, when you still were at TYT, I remember chatting with you in the office space. I wasn't out there in LA too much, but, um, same yeah. roots, just, you're probably a little bit closer to that because of the whole bloodline thing. Yeah. You were, you, you were doing sports, right? You were the, I think I came on and did the sports stuff with Rick, yeah. but like I was doing the, you know, I was on the campaign trail, all that good stuff when I first started. I left, uh, by the. By then, I gotcha. Think, well, I think so. Yeah. What What's going on with you? I mean, do you have anything you want to plug right off the bat, and then we can get into the news of the week? Oh, really? No, I'm just I'm, I do the same thing every day. Uh, if I wasn't on the majority report right now, I'd probably be watching it. So, um, you know, this is the the one rare instance where I get to be on it Perfect. instead of uh, watching it from the gym or something. Ah, well, I mean, we get it. You work out. No big deal. Um, let's uh, let's dive into it then. So Clarence Thomas, kind of a bad guy. Uh, n- news broke yesterday that he essentially did not disclose that he'd sold a series of properties to Harlan Crow, Club for Growth billionaire, who he's just is so close with. Um, and then, like, so that just came out in ProPublica. I would imagine that there's more stuff coming because he essentially stopped disclosing his relationship with this guy in 2004 when the LA Times came out with their own kind of like expose about the disclosures. Then he just stopped recording it and seemingly ramped up his financial connection with this uh, Nazi memorabilia collecting billionaire. Yeah, I thought in the United States of America, um, it was okay for black men 
to be friends with white men. That's what I thought. But turns out, uh, I guess we've we've moved beyond that. I guess we're going back in time. Uh, you know, Clarence Thomas is a baller. Okay, he he was going on the lamest. I mean, the absolute lamest vacations uh, known to man with Harlan Crow. Um, have you seen the photos? I mean, they were they were literally yeah. like at first I thought they were doing like Jeffrey Epstein shit, and then I realized like, oh no, Harlan Crow actually is just like um, he's he's a billionaire or whatever. So like, of course he travels in Jeffrey Epstein style. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, like Jeffrey Epstein style, like yachts and cruises and and private jets and whatever. But they're like going to you know Thailand together, and then it's like a family photo, and then Clarence Thomas and and Ginny are like on the side. Yeah. So at first I thought to myself like, oh, they're doing like shadowy sex stuff. You know what I mean? They're doing mm -hmm. like butt stuff for sure. And then I saw those family photos, and I was like, oh my god, it's it's way worse. I think they're like legit friends. Yeah, which well, is very weird. It's not that weird, though, right? I mean, they have the same values, but friends don't buy. I mean, again, as a homeowner, right? Let's return to this. You're one of the people who would understand. Oh, that's why I'm defending them. Me and yes. Harlan Crow are very similar. You guys are. Yeah. I mean, it, like that's one thing that you have in common. Do you also have a house that you purchased from a Supreme Court justice that you rent out to her family members? Um, I do not. I'm I'm working on it. Uh, you know, I thought to myself, Katanji Brown Jackson, she's probably going to be a communist. Obviously, Joe Biden is uh, pretty much FDR reincarnated. So I suspected that like his Supreme Court pick was probably going to be uh, one that reflects my values. I mean, I am very similar to Harlan Crow in the sense that I also have uh, memorabilia. I was going to say that I, things that I despise, like uh, immediately Master Chief. Uh, bad guy, okay, very Got bad it. guy. Have his helmet right there. I I look to it sometimes, and and ponder and think to myself like, you know, this is a the the great evil that he did against Legion. And then of course I have the USSR Yushanka back there. I look back at that to say like, wow, I mean, just awful, just awful stuff uh, that that those guys did. Um, and then the Antifa book as well, like all the stuff that I have back there. Pretty much, you know, just like Harlan Crow uh, has the the you know the signed copy of Mein Kampf. Yeah, that's that's a that's a pretty rare piece of memorabilia. You have to go out of your way to buy the signed copy of Mein Kampf. I would say. Yeah. No, he just. I think he just really likes uh, Hitler's writings and 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 what he. What he delivered for the medium was really, really huge in like racial screeds, I think. I mean, the prose is just out of control. Uh, he that's, really, why, that's why he got it. He got it for the prose. Um, and the other thing, do we have this of Charles Murray? You, I'm sure you saw, uh, saw this, Hassan. But Charles Murray, known like skull measurer, race science yeah. guy, a bell curve author, dedicated not one book, but two books to Harlan Crow. So like that's my favorite. Yeah. That's but, my but, favorite thing like when you're when you're rich like it's so weird like it, it, it's like you're a rich guy. Why don't you do like fun shit? Like why is it that you're so hyper uh focused on like, you know, fascist stuff and like race perverts that you pay money to like write books about? Because they're uh, weird you know, sniveling losers. Like this so, so here we, I mean even the way a, a human accomplishment, the pursuit of excellence in the arts and sciences, 800 BC to 1950. First of all, anybody that like does sweeping historical uh, books that aren't focused on a specific time and try to like make grand claims about humanity in large swaths, kind of a red flag in and of itself because it, it, you end up just whittling racial and ethnic groups down to crude stereotypes, although that's Charles Murray's kind of thing. But here it is. Yeah. Uh, to Erwin Stelzer, Charles uh, Krautheimer, and Harlan Crow, it turns oh, out... Those, that's, the, that's the Avengers squad of like yeah. the most... Yeah, no, he says, turns out I have brothers after all. That's what he calls them. Charles Murley and Har Har Harlan Crow, bros. Charles Krautheimer, uh, didn't he die recently? Like he died a couple years back? Yeah, yeah, he's dead. Yeah, yeah he I, I, was... I, yeah. I mean, he is, he, he was something else. Um, you know, great love giving uh, Pulitzer prizes to guys like this. Uh, I, I think one of my favorite parts about 
uh, I, I would say uh, Murray's work is that it just like is so easy to to just like look up and and absolutely eviscerate with like one study conducted in India in between like uh, you know the noticeable drop off of IQ for uh, you know in, in during famine season versus when uh, you know people are uh, eating properly immediately it's just like you you eviscerate the the uh, genetic component of like race and IQ and and then you don't need to write that book but of course uh, when there are billionaires like Harlan Crow out there who will fund you you will constantly write books like that because at a, at a certain point I don't know if it's for the love of the game or if it's for <laughs> money or maybe both which of course brings me back to Clarence Thomas um, everyone is is talking about how this is like yeah, you know, this guy's getting greased. His his wheels are getting greased by Harlan Crow. But I also kind of feel like, I mean, and I'm I feel you you'll agree with me on this. They they're just, you know, they're they have the same opinions. Like Clarence Thomas wouldn't have gotten to the position that he got to if he didn't believe the the freak shit that he believes. You know what I mean? If he wasn't yeah. uh severely interested in like deregulation, uh playing uh a a profoundly important role in in hyper focusing on culture war wedge issues uh backed by the republican party like he would not be a supreme court justice if he wasn't the perfect guy for that right yeah so, i mean it becomes kind of like hard to to uh, the, the lines get a little bit blurred where how much of his ideology is informed by these rich guys essentially paying him and, and validating him and how much of it is like uh uh uh, organic because I feel like part of it too is these guys carry water for right wing reactionary BS not just because they're true believers but also because they're reinforced with money all the time all the money's on that side and so it's easy to be like this lifestyle is great for me and all the stuff I'm saying is validated based on the prosperity gospel essentially yeah the way I see it I think like he probably will look at or suggest cases that like maybe Harlan Crow's friends uh, might be interested in, right? Mm -hmm. But other than that, I think he's already conditioned to be like the Republican Party's weapon. I mean, that's what the Supreme Court has always been. That's what the Supreme Court will always be. It's always a political tool. Um, it 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 represents the the two party divide. And for the most part, uh, I think everyone that endlessly pontificates on the Supreme Court's like. Uh, institution and it's it's uh you know what it represents in american democracy is a fucking silly person um it's just of course it's always been partisan um but i think and this is my suggestion maybe there is another element to the story that we're not looking into mm. what if harlan crow is really into horse porn that's a good point. I, I hadn't considered that yet. Uh, like they, what, they're united on ideological. Sorry to cut you off. I was being a misogynist. No. I apologize. Because yeah, they're I mean, united on like uh, you know they're both uh, you know they're they're both uh, capitalist uh, rich perverts that love talking about tort reform or whatever the fuck Republicans talk about behind closed doors when they're not talking about race science. I suspect since we know what we know about Clarence Thomas. And his interests that pertain to uh, bestiality, allegedly, mm -hmm. uh, and and horse porn. Maybe Harlan Crow's into that too. He maybe maybe he saw the Anita Hill testimony and was like, "That's my shit. That's mm -hmm. my guy. That's a lifelong friend I just made right there." Yeah, maybe you, know? you kind of just judge their trips by appearances. You don't know what's going on on that super yacht. There could be some freaky shit happening over there, Hassan. Absolutely. You re why are you being ageist? No, I, I think, well, I think that those guys do freaky stuff regardless. Um, I mean. For sure. You know, oh, blood yeah. work, that sort of thing. Yeah, they're all repressed, and that makes for the the, the craziest uh, crap here. All right, let's talk about this uh, this leaker. If if Because I'm, the, the story's unfolding a bit. This um, The Washington Post and, and the New York Times ended up digging into who the, who the leaker of this, top secret, secret military information was. It was coming out on the private Discord server. Turns out it was a 21-year-old named Jack Tiexiera who came from a military family. Te Tesharia, I think. That's how you say it. Like Tesharia? Gotcha. Yeah, he was an um, I IT guy uh, for military communications, and he had some high security clearance. And, like, I'm seeing... I, I, first of all, I'm skeptical anytime 
we're talking about classified information and keeping it under wraps being the highest priority ever, so much so that we need to throw someone in prison. At the same time, though, I'm annoyed at some of the arguments I'm seeing comparing this guy, who seems kind of like a bit of an edgelord, to reality winner, to Chelsea Manning, to Julian Assange, to even mm-hmm. Snowden. None of this is like actual whistleblower stuff. He wanted to brag to his Discord server um, and shit post a lot. Like there were videos also of him shooting guns and saying slurs. We probably know why the right is probably gearing up to defend him now. I know Tucker had a segment last night because of that. But like this was not really for journalism at all. This was for bragging rights. And I think that yeah. matters. Um, I'm a fan of leaks. Uh, as, I, as I tweeted earlier, I, I don't care if it's because you saw like the American uh, military, you know, eviscerate journalists and civilians from a helicopter. And you were like, this is unacceptable. Uh, You know, journalists need to know about this. The American public deserves to know. The world deserves to know. Or because you have like a like a splinter discord server full of little groped up shouties. Like you have a bunch of discord (laughs) kittens that you that are acting out and they're not listening to you uh, uh, when you when you write these really convoluted write ups about uh, American military operations and and our level of involvement in Ukraine. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I'm a fan of leaks. I'm a fan of leaks when it's the War Thunder forum, uh, and you know people are are arguing on there uh, about the F-16s capabilities, and then they leaked classified intelligence. I mean, uh, or classified information about it's like missile capabilities, things like that. Um, you know, this has happened time and time again. I like it when uh, the U.S. military is is has like secret bases all around the world, and they use Strava when they're running around the base and then they end up basically drawing a perfect pattern around the base or when they're using well Quizlet <laughs> in the Netherlands at a nuclear facility to remember nuclear launch codes. All the things that I just mentioned to you are very real. They all happen. Uh, and I'm fond of them. Uh, so for that reason and that reason alone, uh, I say uh, free my man. You know, all he wanted was to make sure his discord kittens uh, were in line and knew that he was an important person. Uh, pretty fucked up that the American government is taking a stance against Discord kittens. Joe Biden's silence on the matter is deafening. Um, well, he said and- the leaks were not that consequential, which undercuts the prosecution element then, because I don't think they were unconsequential. Like, uh, I mean, Hassan, I don't know if that's true, though, right? Like, don't you think the the, the value or the... Or I'll say I just I disagree slightly. I think that the substance of the leaks does ne- does matter, and the intention behind it does matter. I mean, I'm, now, I don't like want this I kid said, in jail for the I mean, rest I, of I his understand. life, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty. Fo- do I do I personally think that the world's largest imperialist superpower is getting owned by a fucking IT journeyman uh, be- <laughs> who literally wanted to flex at like sixteen year old fans of uh, of this? This other YouTube gun guy, Oxide. Yes, I, I think that's hilarious. Um, the intention behind it is is wrong. Sure, he, he wanted the flex on him, and and that's like a silly reason to do it, especially when you do it like that. When you just do printouts, basically, uh, you you do run into some issues. You could compromise people, innocent people. Uh, there could be some some you know legitimate threat to like innocent lives and stuff. So on that regard, I think that's always the reason why you got to go with a journalist like, you know, Ken Klippenstein, right? Yeah. But but ultimately, I think you and I are in agreement then that it's just like ridiculous to, you know, uh, throw the book at this guy. But then there's the other part of the story that I, I'm going to I'm going to stop being sarcastic and, and uh, you know, make jokes about this for a moment. And that is the the real skepticism that I hold for uh, any kind of classified information coming out uh, that that Bellingcat has uh, found, especially where yeah. you know I I feel like um, on the one hand it is funny to think that like the U.S. military has so many leaks and could be compromised like this. Uh, I mean, humans are the the greatest security flaw in in ever any kind of uh, you know cybersecurity uh, protocol. But um, whenever I see stuff like this, I, I like to look through exactly what the information was that was leaked because 
I think it gives me a little bit more of an understanding of whether or not the American government intended for it to get out to be like, listen, we know all of this stuff. Or like when the CIA likes to declassify certain things uh, specifically yeah. to flex on the haters. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we did give the Mujahideen uh, stinger missiles. Like, guess what? And now they're using it against us, but who cares, right? Or that kind like of limited hangouts or, you know, yeah. cons large, uh, releasing heavily redacted uh, JFK documents but uh, to satiate people, but hiding the true story for decades and decades. Like, I mean, we should be skeptical, it, it, but the, the haphazard nature of the leaks is also in and of itself a story like that seemed to be pulled from everywhere. Some of it had to do with... Ukraine and their need for ammunition. Others had to do with Russia's, uh, uh, the U.S. and United States' assessment that Russia has been failing in the war. Ken and The Intercept reported about how some of the documents show that the U.S. is fearful of increased kind of tensions and escalation with Iran and that Saudi Arabia is pushing it. That part is very interesting to me. But again, like, it, the the reason that the leaks are don't seem to be tailored to or tethered to any kind of theme here is because it was just like whatever this kid could get his hands on it seems like to to show off. But the, the in principle, I'm I am totally in agreement with you. I just think this is like a weird case that we've never seen before. Yeah, but I do ultimately think if it's not like the American government deliberately, uh, you know, revealing this information, which it very well might not be, um, and it could just be as stupid as what we think it actually is in the way that the media is reporting it, um, then uh, I don't know. I'm still conflicted on it because this is like the kind of uh, intelligence and the kind of information that I'd like to know about and I would, I think the public should know about. Uh, I don't really care if it is uh, like I, I don't really care if if yeah. uh, I, you know it, it's just uh, done with the wrong intentions because hey maybe sometimes we learn things that are uh, you know that are truly profoundly important for us to know um, that uh, you know we we never would have uh, otherwise so so uh, let's speaking of free speech and open access to information. We uh we had a bit of a, a fallen out from some of the two biggest free speech warriors in in the country in Elon Musk, the guy helping the Rendra Modi censor in India, and Matt Taibbi, the uh free speech warrior and journalist who used a billionaire as his source, allegedly. And I hate to see my two favorite kings fight like that. You're right. Right. Participated in like a limited hangout that if if he ha if Taibbi had been working on behalf of the CIA and they said, hey, here's a bunch of information, not everything is being given to you, and also you have to publish it on CIA.gov uh, so to give us publicity because we want to show that the CIA is rebranding. We're now very much pro uh, democracy in, in South America, and we're going to help you... Um, uh, Elon Musk, please come help, or sorry, Taibbi, please come and help us make that case. It, it's a little different because that's the government, but the, I would think that if you're on the left, you understand that major social media companies uh, and capitalists and billionaires also have a detrimental effect on society, not just intelligence agencies. That's kind of exactly what he did, except he just did it with Twitter. And now, Elon Musk threw him under the bus in 0.2 seconds after he embarrassed himself defending uh, Elon Musk to the other great Hassan, Mehdi Hassan on, on uh, Peacock. Yeah. Um, very sad to see uh, where Matt Taibbi has is, is gotten to. Uh, I used to be a big fan. Um, you know, another frequent uh, guest on the show, Alex Perrine and Matt Tavey used to have a show called the Tarfer Report. That's how big of a fucking fan I was. I used to listen to them. And honestly, I mean, Matt Tavey and his vocal fry makes it unlistenable. Like, sorry for the misandry, but, you know, straight up, he is like a hard listen. That's how big of a fan I was. <laughs> um, and and uh, honestly, it, it's really sad to see him fall from grace like this, but I think he's caked up, so he's doing all right. You know, uh, good for him. But uh, the thing is, you know, they, I mean, they, they, they just, 
they want to make money wherever they can. Uh, I feel like it's it's like half a uh, genuine ideological separation uh, from the rest of the left, which they, I guess, somewhat were a part of. They certainly were a part of it. And when I say they, I mean uh, Glenn Greenwald and, and Matt Taibbi. Um, and, and, and partially because there is... Uh, some some money to be made in that uh, in that other direction, and partially because they have uh, big egos and they feel like they're not getting the respect that they deserve, or they never got the respect that they deserved under the Trump administration. Like somewhere along the way, their brains fried. Um, and and uh, seeing Matt Taibbi, of course, run defense and do corporate PR for Twitter is pretty wild. Yeah, uh, corporate PR for Twitter's new boss, who is a billionaire, is pretty wild. Um, you know, these guys have done. Such incredible work, Lee Fong as well, uh, uh, especially have done such incredible work talking about like dark money, tracing it back, uh, and and talking about uh, you know how a, a bourgeois state uh, designed uh, for a capitalist purpose is always going to yield results like this. So then, like cutting out the middleman, which would be the government in this circumstance, and going directly to the corporate mega donor and and doing PR for them is, in some ways, worse. <laughs> I think then you know, uh, uh, then then working even with the government, I guess, because the government is bad because it works at the behest of corporations. It's not that like all forms of governance are bad and wrong and immoral across the board. I'm not some you know libertarian weirdo. Um, but they are. So That's the point, though, Hassan. Like the reason that he, we're kind of seeing that play out right now. Taibbi's crit criticism of Occupy Wall Street doesn't doesn't seem to be, when you look back on it now, tethered to any real leftism. It was just an opportunity because libertarians are the ones that constantly want to undercut the government and they'll focus on the national security state because that has the broadest appeal to leftists like us. I mean, look at how we view the Snowden revelations and Greenwald and how much that did for him in terms of currying favor with the left that's all gone now but there yes the left wants to undercut the national security state because we believe in other elements of government and because the national security state is anti-democratic um the libertarian mindset is no that's a part of the whole thing that we want to take down and corporations are not a, not a that's a separate entity that we trust more frankly it's just odd because like you know the 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 massive social media companies are obviously mingling with uh, national security interests and basically give everything to the American government or whoever their foreign allies might be, uh, or whoever their foreign owners might be uh, for for any given matter. I think there were examples of this with respect to Saudi Arabia, like uh, you know unmasking, doxing, finding uh, you know Shia uh, Saudi nationals in on U.S. soil. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and, and, uh, and now they even have a, a, a bigger vice grip on, uh, Twitter, uh, same with China, really. I mean, I'm not an anti-China person by any means. Yeah. Many people would say that I find, uh, Xi Jinping to be the top Xi, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and a legend in his, uh, in his own right for, uh, all of the glorious work that he's done. Many people uh, with, are saying. With, with high speed rail, that's what other people say about me. I'm not saying that that's what I, uh, that's what I represent or anything. But um, you know, even then, I mean, this guy uh, has Tesla facilities in Shanghai. Uh, uh, you know, the Chinese government does have a lot of power over him. Uh, they could get access to whatever they wanted to, uh, whatever kind of compromising information they wanted to. Um, but I guess for Matt Taibbi, it's okay because it's like Elon Musk doing it and they used to be friends. Um, I guess it's okay when uh, all social media offer back doors to, to the federal government, whether it be the NSA or whether it be the CIA or FBI. Um, you know, that kind of stuff would have been really interesting rather than the uh, weird palace intrigue surrounding like, uh, you know, uh, whether or not uh, Twitter employees were stopping hunter biden's penis from being released to the yeah. public which um, is a totally understandable ask by the biden campaign they were also not in government at the time and again the stuff that there were we now know that trump was making requests as president to take down chrissy teigen tweets which like if 
the principle of what he was reporting on was consistent, that would be in some ways a bigger story. But like you brought up yeah. China and I, I'm, I've been raising the alarm on the show for a while about the ramp up in anti-China rhetoric as like being basically the only bipartisan consensus in Washington right now. Um, like they, they were able to get the chips act through that, uh, basically just by making it a Chinese competition bill when you could have had a straight up domestic investment onshoring bill, but they're like, no, we have to do this in the xenophobic way. And then the whole crackdown on TikTok. But do, do people realize what the United States' record is in terms of data, uh, s stealing people's data here in the U.S.? We have an informally connected relationship with our government and our social media companies as opposed to the direct Chinese government investment in TikTok. But it's like, it's, in my opinion, essentially a distinction without difference based on the way that our data actually had been dragnet hoarded by a lot of groups like the NSA. Yeah, uh, one of my one of my favorite conversations surrounding this is like, uh, you know, one of my favorite things about this entire story is that uh, you know, China could just basically bypass uh, having uh, ownership over this massive social media company and just go to the data brokers directly, and it would probably make uh, it would probably be more cost effective for them if they wanted to do like rampant surveillance on U.S. citizens. Um, they could hire or uh, purchase a, a uh, Israeli surveillance technology that the United States also is currently commissioning while simultaneously saying you shouldn't do that to your allies, to Israel. Uh, or they could utilize uh, Palantir probably. I mean, I don't know. Actually, Palantir might not you, uh, work with China. But I, I guess like if you if you give Peter Thiel enough blood boys, he'll let you have it. Uh, he'll let you use it. So there's so many different ways of surveilling uh, U.S. citizens, we do it regularly. Like we, as in like the United States government does it regularly. They do it to their allies. And then also on top of that, these uh, data brokers basically release all this kind of information to law enforcement or to any kind of corporation that wants to sell you, uh, you know, balding medication because you talked about it one time. Uh, so it's just... It is what it is. Uh, I think it's just competition. Uh, they don't like that, uh, you know, TikTok is a very, very successful social media platform. And that very successful social media platform isn't owned by the Silicon Valley tech giants. In some ways, I think this is the federal. I mean, in, in some ways, I think this is the federal government trying to, um, you know, sell this off to an American owner. Partially oh, yeah. so that they can control it and partially so that they can give like a gift to Silicon Valley, I guess. Yeah, do you uh, think that uh, Meta's repeated uh, lobbying efforts and campaign contributions had anything to do with the nature of those hearings? I mean, of course it did, right? Like, Instagram is terrified of TikTok, and Instagram's owned yeah. by Meta. Yeah, uh, for sure. I think that that definitely plays a role, and xenophobia also plays a role. It makes it feel, it makes politicians feel like they're doing work. You know what I mean? This is the this is the political equivalent of you like you know, uh, opening up the Excel spreadsheet and like, you know, crunching numbers as soon as your manager is walking behind you. And then yeah. immediately you go back and switch over and you start watching the majority report uh, in your headphones as soon as they walk away. That's what they're, that's kind of what they're doing as well. So it's like a win, win, win situation. Uh, you know, you, you get to beef up anti-Chinese, uh, you know, xenophobic uh, narratives, which is good. Because uh, a lot of Americans are, are uh, you know, very chauvinistic and, and very imperialist. And they have the sense of entitlement where they feel like we are the number one country on the planet. How dare the Chinese, like, come after us and, and threaten our uh, global uh, hegemonic power status. Um, so I think that, that plays a role in, like, uh, garnering support from constituents to some degree. Especially constituents who vote. Uh, you know, TikTok is... is uh, you, everyone uses TikTok, but it's it's overwhelmingly younger, right? Yeah. Um, and those guys don't vote, as we know. Uh, so th that's probably another motivation. But definitely, I think Meta Meta and its lobbying efforts played a role in this as well, for sure. Let's uh, let's talk about one of your two senators over there in California, Diane Feinstein, who I feel like the calls to, for her to resign 
because of well documented in a like cognitive mental decline from her colleagues speaking anonymously to the media to anecdotes that you hear just when you speak to people behind the scenes to everything that's been said publicly she's now missed dozens of days as the second most important democrat on the judiciary committee and we were seeing this with respect to abortion the effort of the biden administration to ensure that as many federal judges are uh, confirmed under this de- now going to be four years, uh, unless someone dies, of a Democratic Senate for uh, the the rest of his term. Like, this is r- existential Democratic threat, getting all of these, uh, the, the, the right-wing takeover of the courts. So getting these judges through is incredibly important and she's just been gone holding up the entire process now thankfully she's going to allow them to replace her on the judiciary committee which sets up a fight with the republicans because they could filibuster it um if any of them uh objects to unanimous uh uh, consent which i would imagine that they will because they're republicans but i mean what's in california the general lay of the land about diane feinstein and how people are feeling about her um, well, as a California resident, uh, I, I love that I'm represented by a 900 year old person <laughs> who is definitely, uh, who definitely has dementia, who, uh, w- needs to wear adult diapers, who, uh, yelled at like a bunch of kindergartners when they were like, Hey, can you not leave uh, behind a planet that is like a dystopian hellscape for us can you do something about climate change we're scared and she was like ha, you can't even vote for me bitch shut the fuck up remember oh, when yeah. Diane, <laughs> i signed did that i remember because i thought that was girl bossing that's right i oh, love yeah. girl bosses i love girl bosses who are older uh i love girl bosses who uh are are demented i think that you know the american government needs more representation from fossil fuels not just the fossil fuel sector, but also directly like someone who was there when the sliced bread was invented, someone who was there when the chocolate chip was invented, um, you know, someone who definitely represents the interests of, of Californians, which is a deep blue state, supposedly. It's great. Yeah. Well, um, here's this tweet. Speaking of, Cal- uh, you know, uh, some of the blue representatives in California, this is Representative Norma Torres. Uh, she says, Dear Senator Feinstein, please get well soon. That's, I, I don't know. I mean, look, she's in the hospital for shingles, but the whole dementia thing, it's, the, that's not going to get better. Okay. Uh, when women age or get sick, the men, like Hassan Piker, are quick to push them aside. When women no, I, age- I've seen- I defended her, as you oh, know. Uh, no, I Lover. mean, but, but you are a man, so you're included in this. When women, when men age or get sick, they get a promotion. Uh, women's rights are human rights. This is also the line that Pelosi took, saying that I don't think this would be happening to a man. Um, I mean, like women's rights are human rights. <laughs> yes, the good, the, a good example of this is like I would love if Chuck Grassley would resign. Another very senior member of the Senate who like tweets a bunch of typos about like there's pigeons in my lawn and all cap stuff that you think he's like trying to write to 911 over text and he just ended up putting it out on Twitter. I was watching the history channel. Yeah, I just random. <laughs> it was pretty good, Chuck Grassley. Um, random garbage like that. Both of them can go and then that nullifies uh, what they're saying there. That's my that's my that's my suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> It's just weird because like we kind of made we kind of made Briar retire, which was a good idea, right? Yes. So like that's a guy, you know what I mean? That doesn't really make yes. sense on that. Well, they front. said the same thing when we wanted Ruth Bader Ginsburg to retire before uh, uh, during the end of Obama's term, um, and then look look what happened. <laughs> Yeah, what happened was girl bossing. That's what happened. I, right. I think it's great that there's a there's a young uh, supermajority of like psychotic freaks uh, that were all uh, you know directly concocted in a laboratory known as the Federalist Society that now will make these decisions uh, that will will eradicate uh, civil liberties for marginalized groups in this country. I, I think that's great. I'm glad that that is Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy. She deserves it. It's her time. And it was her time. And I personally thought it was awesome 
when in the middle of COVID, this person who had cancer 11 fucking times decided to go and officiate a wedding in the middle of COVID without a fucking mask when she had cancer 11 times and was like also 800 years old. It just showed that, you know, women can do everything. Women yeah. can do anything if they want to. If they want to destroy the, the uh, like the, the crumbs, a semblance of like what remains of American democracy, which was always in theory to begin with, uh, if you want to eviscerate that remaining shred, you should be able to do so. Uh, that's girl bossing. Um, I think that's what you know, I that's great. Yeah, I got that. That's why I got into this business so I could girl boss and uh, and and ensure that the trans agenda takes over and that within ten short years every child uh, is trans or non-binary. I mean, I I know we don't say that yeah. out loud, but we do say it in our group chat privately. So I yeah, mean, all the time. Yeah, I, I, like that's that is our goal, and um, I, I, I'm trying to bring about the destruction of the American family, and the only way I know how to do that is in a power pants suit. So you guys will be seeing me dressed and private up property, also, soon. right, Emma? That's true. Yeah. Uh, getting a lot of private property. Um, I think I, I think that yeah, that's why I I am in favor of the gerontocracy that we have. I think that's great. You know, it's, I agree. it's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, Gavin Newsom also said like the classic, uh, you know, Joe Biden line where he was like, we're going to put a black woman in this position. Like we're going to, you know, I'm going to appoint a black woman in her stead. And it's just like, why do you have to say that? Like, don't say that. Just you're, do you're it. You're undermining. You're, you're, yeah, just do it. Just say you're pointing to the most qualified person to, to be in this position. When you say you're going to do it, uh, you're going to appoint a black person, a black woman there, you're literally undercutting that black person's accomplishments right like you, you it's it's like such transparent pandering too it's so silly it's like uh when when you know leaders in the democratic party unfortunately i can't believe gavin newsom is one of them uh openly take on the memes that the right claims about them and just uh, they own it yeah you know it's so weird well so uh odd. hassan Thank you so much for coming on, my friend. Really appreciate it. Uh, any last words before we let you go? Um, uh, no, thank you. Thank you for having me. I love the majority report. And, uh, you know, it's it's unfortunate that my real uncle Sam Cedar was not on today. But Emma, you, you're doing a great job. Okay. All right. Well, then uh, I guess that means, what is it? We're cousins? I, I think so. I, think I don't so. know. I don't know how that works. It's a complicated family tree. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, next time, next time, he'll be back. Appreciate it, Hassan. Uh, talk to you later. Right. Bye, guys. Bye.